This is the 19th lecture for MA1012. In this lecture, we'll talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of square matrices. Recall that we think of the column vectors um, of uh, this form x is uh, x1 dot 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 xn, a column vector, as a geometric object, which in our earlier description of vectors was somehow, for three-dimensional vectors, was something like a little arrow, uh, capital X. In three-dimensional space, it was some x, y, z, or in our current notation, x1, x2, x3, some with three different numbers sitting in it, and it sat in three-dimensional space as a kind of little arrow. Um, that was a geometric picture, and of course this is um, really going to be n dimensions, so we can't really draw the picture for n bigger than 3, but intuitively we think of it as something like that. A linear transformation of such a vector um, is a vector that arises by multiplying by a matrix. So we take a vector x as input, and we output the vector ax, where a is uh, some uh, matrix. That's called a linear transformation. And the idea that we want to consider is what the geometry of linear transformations look like. Intuitively, even if we can't really draw the actual picture because the vectors x might be enormously tall, they might be, instead of three-dimensional, they might be a million-dimensional. Nevertheless, if we carry out such a transformation, we have in mind a picture in our heads that it looks something like taking an input uh, x vector and giving us an output ax vector. And what we want to do is to try and get some sense, some kind of geometric feeling for what that looks like, the dynamics of this kind of linear transformation of vectors. We'll only be interested in the simplest case, which is going to be where, where A is a square matrix. A will be a square matrix. And uh, so in the case of the picture here, it would be maybe a 3 by 3 matrix. So we'd have a three-dimensional input vector and three-dimensional output vector. We want to imagine what that looks like. Maybe we, maybe we start varying the vector x and look at all sorts of possible different input vectors. And we look at what the different outputs come out looking like when they come out the other end. Um, so we input a vector x by multiplying by matrix A and see what comes out. The vector Ax comes out and it looks somehow transformed. Um, what could be the simplest picture that could happen? The simplest geometric thing that could happen in that situation would be that the geometric, the, the, that the vector x that comes in uh, gets transformed by the simplest geometric transformation which we can have, which is still somehow linear, and that would be maybe it could just get stretched to some other vector, like 2x or 3x or something like that. Could that happen? Um, so naturally what we're interested in is um, the simplest thing that could happen would be that a vector x gets transformed by a stretching or a squishing by some constant factor. So we'll say that um, uh, a non-zero we're only interested in non-zero vector. The zero vector always gets sent to the zero vector by any linear transformation. So we're interested in non-zero vectors. A non-zero vector x is an eigenvector of uh, a square matrix A. Eigenvector if Ax is just x uh, scaled by a stretch factor, so it might get stretched or squished, a stretch, uh, sorry, stretch uh, factor. So um, stretched, maybe in, by being doubled or tripled or something like that, or squished. Um, and so the output uh, Ax is um, some factor, some constant number times x. And it's become traditional in this subject, in linear algebra, to always write that factor using a Greek letter. This is going to be a number, right? This is not a, a, a matrix. So the simplest thing that a, that a matrix could do to a vector is to have the vector just get, say, doubled or tripled or multiplied by 0, multiplied by a number, multiplied by 7, multiplied by minus 2, multiplied by some number, some factor, some numerical factor in the front of the vector.
That's the simplest thing that could happen to a vector. And so that's the case we're going we're to be concerned with. An eigenvector is a vector that just gets stretched or squished by a given matrix A. It's an eigenvector of A. Um, so as I say, the traditional notation, which is unfortunate, is the use of a Greek letter. I know students dislike Greek letters intensely. Um, so um, x is an eigenvector eigenvector of a matrix A, a squared matrix A, if uh, AX is just X multiplied by a factor, and we'll write that factor always as lambda X, where lambda is a, some, a number, uh, which is called the eigenvalue of X. Eigen from the from the German, meaning the proper uh, proper vector, proper value. It doesn't really have much of a meaning in this context, but it, what the, the main thing we want to keep track of is this equation here. The idea that x is the input to this transformation. A is transforming x, so A is a kind of machine that eats an x and spits out some kind of output vector. The input is x, the output is ax, and it would be a special situation, a rare uh, special circumstance, that the output just happened to be some number lambda times the input. That's a situation we wouldn't expect usually to occur, but it might rarely occur. When it does, it'll turn out to be the, the sort of thing we'll want to analyze. That'll be a, a, a natural circumstance that'll be of particular importance in, uh, in, in, in a lot of applications of, of, of matrices. So um, conceptually what we're saying is that, in, 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 geometrically, is that all that happened to the vector x again is that it somehow got stretched. So we input a vector x, that was the input, and output from the transformation was another vector, which was called ax. Um, but uh, and that transformation could be applied to any vector. Any vector could be input. We could pick this vector, you could pick this vector, you could pick this vector, you could pick any other any vector at all, and all the vectors get transformed linearly by the linear transformation A. But certain special vectors are eigenvectors, not all of them. Usually they're quite rare. Among the vectors, they'll usually be a a tiny collection of uh, only certain special vectors in certain special directions will actually be eigenvectors because they get input in some particular direction and they get output going exactly the same direction but maybe multiplied by some scalar factor like this it might come multiplied by three times it's going the same direction but a different length and so it's lambda x lambda being a number okay so how do can we find um, find these things. Well first let's let's just look at an example to make sure we know what we're talking about. Um, suppose we look at the matrix A which is 3, 5, 1, minus 1. I claim that the vector x is 5, 1 is an eigenvector. x is. And it's not the eigenvector, there will be other ones. But it's an eigenvector, one of the possible eigenvectors, one of the eigenvectors of A, of this matrix A. This vector is an eigenvector of this matrix. How do we see it? What we can do to check that that's true is simply to multiply them out. Multiply together and see what we get. So we'll start by trying to multiply. Um, our matrix A was 3, 5, 1, minus 1. X was 5, 1. And to check that it is an eigenvector, we'll multiply AX and see what comes out. 3, 5, 1, minus 1 times uh, 5, 1. That's a 5. Okay, 5, 1 is. So that's 3 times 5 is 15 plus 5. 15 plus 5 is 20. And then 5 times 1 is, is 5. Minus 1 is 4. And I can recognize that looks a lot like that. So the output, 24, looks a lot like the input, 5, 1. In fact, it looks exactly like 4 fives and four ones. And so it looks exactly like four times five one. And so it's four x. And so we can see ax is four x in this example. So th this x is an eigenvector of this matrix A with eigenvalue four. So the vector x equals five one is n. It's not the eigenvector, it's an eigenvector. There may be many others. Um, is an eigenvector of a equals 3, 5, 1, minus 1.
with eigenvalue lambda equals 4. Okay, so there's an example done out in detail to show that if we were given the matrix and given the vector, we could check to see if it's an eigenvector with a given eigenvalue. Okay, so that's how we can check to see if something is an eigenvector. But note that uh, x equals 5, 1 here was an eigenvector of this particular matrix, but x equals, uh, uh, let's say, 500, 100 will also be an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. Lambda was 4 here. Lambda will still be 4 here because if you just scale the x by 100 times, you'll scale the ax by 100 times. After all, that's how matrix multiplication works. It's a linear transformation. It doesn't mind rescaling. It commutes perfectly with rescaling. So if you scale the x uh, input, you scale the ax output. And so it doesn't really change the fact that it still satisfies this equation. I put 100 times here and 100 times here, and I get the same thing. It still works. So you can see you, get, you still get lots of eigenvectors. So as soon as you have one eigenvector, this one, then you get lots of other ones by just rescaling it, which aren't very interesting. They aren't very important. Um, so this is we want to think of as a kind of trivial example of constructing a new eigenvector from an old one. Let's consider the same matrix. A is 3, 5, 1, minus 1. And consider a vector y, which is going to be um, uh, 1, minus 1. Then um, Ay is 3, 5, 1, minus 1 times 1 minus 1 is 3 times 1 is 3 minus 5. 3 minus 5 is, mi is minus 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. And this looks a lot like that. The output looks a lot like the input. In fact, it's just minus 2 times 1 and then minus 2 times minus 1. And so you can write it as minus 2 times 1 minus 1. So it's minus 2 times y. And so we have ay is minus 2y. Uh, so uh, uh, y uh, equal, let's write it out, y is 1 minus 1 is an eigenvector Oh, sorry, um, 1 minus 1 is an eigenvector of A equals 3, 5, 1 minus 1 with eigenvalue. Lambda is, in this case, minus 2. So, um, so you can see there's the same matrix now has two eigenvectors. We have the same matrix. Um, we have... Um, the same matrix here has had the uh, eigenvector x, but it also has this eigenvector y. So we can have a single matrix with multiple eigenvectors. Um, A was 3, 5, uh, 1, minus 1. And then we had lambda is, uh, we had lambda is 4, which gave us uh, eigenvector x is 5, 1. And we had lambda is minus 2, which gave us eigenvector y is uh, 1 minus 1. So you can see it's possible for the same transformation to have different eigenvectors, more than one eigenvector with different eigenvalues. So one question might be, why do I care about eigenvectors? What's the point of them? In this simple example, we can already see that this, this gives us a basis. This is what's called a basis of eigenvectors. Remember, a basis is enough vectors, just enough vectors, to span uh, of, uh, to span the um, the whole of the of the space that we're dealing with. In this case, we're dealing with a space which is the two-dimensional space. These are two-dimensional vectors, so we're looking at the space R2 of uh, vectors with two entries in them. And there there are two such vectors, and they're linearly independent. So you can see right away that they form a basis of the plane R2. Um, so, uh, it, so it's the natural basis in which to study this this matrix. So what we've what we've were saying before was that the the smart thing to do often is to pick the the, the wise choice of basis in which some some problem becomes studied more naturally, um, the right basis in which to work. And very often, 
uh, you'll find that a, a matrix, like a square matrix, will have a basis of eigenvectors, and that's very often the right basis to work in for a lot of different problems. So instead of working in terms of the standard basis, expressing vectors in the standard basis, we express them in terms of uh, some amount of x and some amount of y. So as an example, if we let z be the vector 3, 1, then it turns out that we can write z as exactly 2 thirds of x minus 1 third of y. And we know how to do that because that's a linear algebra problem to figure out how much x and how much y you need to add up to give us z. We know there exists such coefficients because x and y are form a basis. There must be unique coefficients so that we can express z as some amount of x and some amount of y added together. There must be a way to make z into a linear combination of x and y. We know there are unique coefficients that do it. We've proven that. And we know how to find them. It's a linear algebra problem to find them. So what we want to know then is um, how do we use the fact that these are eigenvectors to be able to do some kind of calculations? What we're claiming is that computations using it for this matrix A become much, much simpler when we work in terms of the basis X and Y than they would have been if we'd worked in terms of the, ba the standard basis of, let's say, I and J. So if we did the standard basis, um, uh, that, was, that was 1, 0, and 0, 1 for the plane. In the standard basis, Z is 3 of the first standard basis element, 1 of the other, 3, 1. But, um, but it turns out that the computations in the standard basis with this matrix are rather complicated. They're much easier for, uh, for this basis, capital X, capital Y. Let's do a simple example. Let's compute out A to the 10 times Z. Now, the obvious way to do that is to multiply A by itself 10 times which is very difficult. It would take a long time to multiply this 2 by 2 matrix by itself to get the 10th power. You'd need 9 matrix multiplications, and that would take a very, a very long time, a lot of pages of paper. But nevertheless, what I can say uh, is because it's an eigen, uh, uh, because, because we have eigenvectors, and because we split Z into a decomposition into eigenvectors, we can do this calculation quickly. Um, how do we do it? Well, we write Z in the basis of X's and Y's, as some amount of x and some amount of y. But we know what a does to x and to y. It just scales each of them by, by certain numbers. It scales them by very simple quantities, which we, can, which we can compute with. So we know exactly what happens to x and to y under a each time we apply a. So if we just do it 10 times, we just apply it 10 times to x, 10 times to y separately. What does a do to x? Well, it multiplies x by 4. What does it do to y? It multiplies by by minus 2. That's what the eigenvalue is. It's the scale factor that the vector gets multiplied by. So every time a hits an x, it multiplies it by 4. Every time a hits a y, it multiplies it by minus 2. And so when it hits it 10 times against an x, it linearly transforms the 2 thirds pull out and the minus pulls out. And so all I have to do is 10 times hit an x with an a and then the one minus one third pulls out, the a goes right through it, and a 10 y. So I have to hit an x 10 times the a, and a y 10 times the a. But every time a hits an x, again, we said every time a hits x, it multiplies by four. Every time a hits y, it multiplies by minus two. So it's easy to figure out what it does when you do it 10 times. It simply multiplies by four 10 times, and multiplies by minus two 10 times. And so it's easy to calculate out what a does to a vector um, by calculating out what it does to x and what it does to y, writing the vector in terms of x's and y's. This becomes much more powerful when we have very large numbers of dimensions. We could have a very, very complicated uh, linear transformation carried out by some matrix A or some enormous power of A. And we could then carry that out uh, explicitly by writing the vectors in terms of a basis of eigenvectors. And then on each eigenvector, the matrix does some very simple thing. It multiplies x by 4, multiplies y by minus 2, does it 10 times, does it 10 times. So it's very easy to do. So I can explicitly do computations by hand. You can see it done right here by hand, even though um, it seems like it might involve an enormous number of matrix multiplications. I didn't do any matrix multiplications. There are no matrix multiplications here. So that explains why it's important. It's important to be able to carry out linear transformations many, many, many times, large numbers of times. It's important to, to reuse eigenvectors, basis of eigenvectors. In general, problems that involve this linear transformation A in our example here, um, 
that they'll all, they'll all become much easier in terms of a basis of eigenvectors. So if I use eigenvector basis, if I break vectors into some amount of this and some amount of that, um, I can then figure out what A does to them very rapidly, and I can calculate things more quickly. And that's really the, the, the strength of it. If you work in the basis of eigenvectors, all the computations become almost straight, almost trivial. They become very straightforward. It behaves almost like a number. The matrix behaves almost like a number. On front of x, it behaves like the number 4. In front of y, it behaves like the number minus 2. And so the matrix behaves like a number in front of each of x and y. And so it becomes very easy to do large computations. But we, So what we've done so far is to say that um, that if we have a vector, we can ask if it's an eigenvector, and we can answer that question. We did that for x and for y. We showed they were eigenvectors. We did it by calculating a times x and showing that it was just a multiple of lambda of x. And the same with a times y. We calculated and showed it was a multiple of y. But where would you get them from in the first place? If nobody hands you an eigenvector, where do you find it from? What we really want to know is how to find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues where do they come from how do we calculate them with a reasonable degree of, of, of efficiency to figure out how we would find them we write down our eigenvector equation this is a very mildly nonlinear equation because the unknown is well x the eigenvector we don't know what it is but also, we don't know what the eigenvalue is. So it's slightly nonlinear in that it's a lambda times x. There's a product here of unknowns. So it isn't quite a linear problem. It's not exactly linear. And once we know lambda, then it becomes linear in x. But if we don't know lambda or x, it's a quadratic unknown here. And that makes it a little bit harder to understand. It's convenient to rewrite this equation by subtracting lambda x from both sides to write it as ax minus lambda x, lambda x, sorry, is um, ax minus lambda x is 0, uh, which we can also write uh, as uh, simply as a minus lambda identity times x equals 0. Because if you expand that out, you multiply the x here, you get ax. You multiply the x here, you get lambda x. So you can see that this equation is equivalent to this one. And that's a very different kind of equation because it manages to separate out in, uh, the problem into two problems. Um, the first problem is um, uh, the existence of an x so that this is satisfied. Okay, Is there such an x? And then how to find it. Um, but when is there such an x? Okay, So what we need to do is we need this matrix to have the property that it makes some non-zero x vector become zero. And that's exactly when it's not invertible. Um, so the the homogeneous system of equations a minus lambda identity um, is uh, is our homogeneous matrix is our matrix multiplied by some x um, so ax equals zero has non-zero uh, solution x if and only if a minus lambda identity is not invertible. If it's invertible, then we could invert both sides and get x is zero. But if it's not invertible, then it turns out that there's always a there's always some uh, vector that non-zero vector that it kills, that it turns to zero. So the existence of a vector x, so that there is a solution for this, is exactly that this thing is not invertible. So then, when is a matrix not invertible? We have a criterion for that. Also, we know that a matrix is not invertible. Um, a minus lambda identity. Again, we don't know what this is, so we're still worried about the fact that that's an unknown. But this guy is not invertible exactly when uh, its determinant is zero. Now, I still don't know what lambda is, so how do I find a determinant with an unknown lambda? What I do is, in fact, I expand this out and treat lambda as an unknown and get an equation for lambda. So if we expand this out, this is a polynomial lambda. This expands out. If you actually compute out the determinant with an unknown, with a variable lambda in it, which we th think of as an unknown, you have an explicitly known matrix A. All the entries are actually given to you, but you don't have no lambda. This expands out to a polynomial in lambda, which is called the characteristic polynomial of A.
of the matrix A. And it, again, I lambda is an unknown. And so, um, so what you're going to do is expand it out and get a polynomial. We'll do some examples. Um, and then the, uh, the eigenvalues are the roots. The eigenvalues lambda are just the roots. of the characteristic polynomial. So let's uh, see if we can do it. So let's work out a complete example of trying to find all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And all the examples are essentially the same. Um, there's not much difference depending on just varying the coefficients in the matrix. So let's just do a simple 2 by 2 example. Now. Um, Parenthetically, remember that we're going to subtract lambda times identity. We're interested in a minus lambda identity, not in a itself. Now, identity is, of course, 1, 0, 0, 1. And so lambda times identity means lambda, 0, 0, lambda. And we're going to subtract that off. a minus lambda identity means subtract that off. So that means a minus lambda identity is a, same matrix we had, but with lambdas subtracted from the diagonal entries. And it's the same lambda all the way down. Lambda, 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 and so on if there are more diagonal entries. So we take the matrix A and subtract lambdas down the diagonal. That gives us A minus lambda identity. And that's the thing whose determinant we have defined. Uh, the procedure we've laid out is that we solve the, the characteristic polynomial. That is to say we set 0 equal to determinant A minus lambda identity which is just the determinant, exactly the determinant of this expression here. Determinant of this matrix here, 1 minus lambda, 2, 3, 2 minus lambda. So we, uh, for 2 by 2, we know how to do determinants. In general, for any size of matrix, when we subtract off these lambdas from the, the, from the diagonal, lambda is an unknown still. We don't have an idea of what lambda could be, so it's a variable. And so this is a determinant of, of a matrix with a variable in its entries. Um, so we'll end up with some polynomial in that unknown lambda. So how does that work with a 2 by 2? It's this times this minus that times that. So it's 1 minus lambda times 2 minus lambda minus 3 times 2. So that's, um, uh, that's let's see, lambda times lambda is lambda squared minus lambda minus 2 lambda is minus 3 lambda and then plus 2 and then that's minus 6. So that gives us lambda squared minus 3 lambda minus 4. And I factor that into lambda plus 1 and lambda minus 4. And so this polynomial in lambda, we have to get used to lambda as a, as a number. It's very important that uh, you get used to Greek letters. Lambda looks, if I draw it more carefully, like this. It's not a letter X. It's not a letter L. It's a lambda. Lambda. Um, and uh, so you should get used to drawing it, and maybe drawing it a little better than I'm doing. Um, so this uh, uh, gives us, this factor gives us that we could have lambda as minus 1 as a, as an eigenvalue. And this one gives us lambda as 4. The roots of this of this quadratic polynomial, this quadratic polynomial lambda, when you factor it, you can see the roots are lambda is minus 1 and lambda is 4. So that, those are the eigenvalues. And it'll turn out that those always give us eigenvalues. All the roots of the characteristic polynomial are eigenvalues. So that's an eigenvalue, and that's an eigenvalue. Now we just define the corresponding eigenvectors. So repeating what we've just done, going back over it, we started with this matrix here as our example. We could have been given any square matrix. We take this one as a simple example. We write out a minus lambda identity by subtracting lambdas from the diagonal entries of a. We subtract lambdas, where a lambda is still an unknown. It's a variable. We calculate the determinant of this 2 by 2. And that gives us, once we factor that determinant, gives us a, uh, some roots, which are the eigenvalues. That's how we can calculate eigenvalues of this matrix. But that only gives us the eigenvalues. It doesn't give us the eigenvectors. We still have to find those. So let's work out the eigenvectors eigenvectors of that particular matrix um, are, um, well, we have to plug in each eigenvalue once at, one at a time. So one of the eigenvalues was lambda is, um, so one of the eigenvalues was lambda is minus 1, and we'll do that one out, um, and then we'll do lambda is 4. 
So for, for lambda is minus 1, we want to look at the matrix A minus lambda identity. We plug in the entries of the matrix A, and then we subtract lambda, which is minus 1, from the diagonal entries. That's lambda A minus lambda identity, minus, minus 1, minus, minus 1, from the diagonal entries. So simplify that, and you get 1 minus minus 2 is 3 and then um, is sorry is uh, is is 2 1 minus minus 1 is 2 uh, then we get 3 2 and then 2 minus minus 1 is 3 okay so there's a minus lambda identity and now what we've got to do is to figure out how to find the eigenvectors eigenvectors for this eigenvalue will satisfy a minus lambda identity x is 0. In other words, they'll satisfy that this should be 0. So 2, 2, 3, 3 times x1, x2 equals 0, 0. This is a linear, a system of linear equations. So I won't go back over all the linear algebra that you need to, to solve these. You'll go through the steps, which I won't do in detail, and calculate out that um, that the solutions to this system of linear equations are given by x is, um, well, we could take 1 minus 1 as a solution, and all we need is to find a solution, and then all the other solutions we can check are actually um, multiples of this one. So this spans the solutions of this system. Uh, all the others, all the solutions are just multiples, any multiple of this one. Um, and so we finally find that, uh, summing it up, that lambda equals minus 1 has as an eigenvector x equals 1 minus 1. So there's the, um, that, that's the, the eigenvector. Well, it spans the eigenvectors. The, all the other eigenvectors, things like 2 minus 2, 7 minus 7, and so on, you could scale this by any factor. You'd still have an eigenvector. So your answer might not exactly agree with mine. As long as they're agreeing up to scale factor, it should be fine. Um, this isn't the only eigenvector. Any multiple of this is also an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. But those are all the eigenvectors with this eigenvalue. They're just the multiples of this one. So now we can go back and try and do it with um, uh, the other one. Lambda is 4, um, gives us a minus lambda identity. Now lambda is 4, so it's 1 minus 4, um, 3, 2, and then uh, 2 minus 4, giving us 1 minus 4 is minus 3, 3, 2, minus 2. And again, we want to solve this linear system. I want to solve a minus lambda identity times unknown vector x is 0. Now we know lambda, so we're in good shape. We've got two possible values of lambda. We're working them both out. Lambda is minus 1, lambda is 4, are two eigenvalues. And so now we're working on the lambda is 4 eigenvalue. It means we know the value of lambda, which means this is actually an explicit matrix, this one. And we just have to work it out, uh, the linear equations. So I'm not going to do the linear algebra. But if you spell out what this equation is saying, it's exactly this equation. We've worked out a minus lambda identity is this matrix here. So put that here. That's a minus lambda identity here. x is some vector of unknowns, x1, x2. Um, I won't do the linear algebra. Um, you can show then that the, uh, the solutions are spanned by, for example, the vector x is 2, 3 uh, spans the solutions. Uh, so the solutions are any multiple of that of that vector. So um, so summing up, we get that lambda is minus one. We had this as an eigenvector, and those are the oh, that's the only eigenvector up to rescaling it by a number. And then lambda is four. We had uh, x is two three is the eigenvector for that eigenvalue up to scaling. Again, if you had twenty thirty, that would be just fine as well. It doesn't really matter. All that matters is it's this guy up to a scale factor. So that spans the solution. So you get um, a, a system of linear equations, which you have to solve in this, both situations. You have to solve linear equations. I won't go in detail about how you solve linear equations. We've discussed that before. Um, so you find that the solutions are spanned by some particular vectors, and you write those vectors down. Those are your eigenvectors. So that's how we can calculate out, given, so again, we're given our matrix, which was A is 1, 2, 3, 2, and we calculated out that it has these two eigenvectors with these two eigenvalues.
So that explicitly calculates out for us, given a matrix, how we determine its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors. The eigenvalues are the, are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. And then for each eigenvalue, you work out a linear system of equations for its eigenvectors. For each eigenvalue, its eigenvectors. And you compute out a basis of solutions of those linear equations for each eigenvalue. And you put them all together. If you're lucky, like you were in this case, you actually get a basis of eigenvectors. We have, we're dealing with a two by two matrix, so it acts on uh, vectors in, in the plane, two dimensional vectors like this one and this one. Um, and um, we found two of those vectors, which are linearly independent. You can see they're linearly independent. They go in different directions. This one goes in the direction one minus one in the plane. You can just see in a picture that uh, one uh, in the x and minus one in the y is going this way. This guy's two, three, so it goes one, two in the x and up one, two, three in the y. You can see they're going in different directions. So it's quite clear that they span the plane. But uh, but you could check that these actually form a basis. So they span the whole plane. And so you can write every vector as some amount of this one plus some amount of that one uniquely. And in that basis of vectors, we maybe we want to call this one y instead of x so that we can think of it as a basis. This is x, this is y, let's say. So those are our eigenvectors. Um, in that basis of this vector and this vector, this linear transformation multiplies this vector by minus 1, multiplies this vector by 4. And so this matrix, this linear transformation, is a scaling of by minus 1 in this direction, a scaling by 4 in this direction. And so in any, uh, for any vector at all, you can write it as some amount of this plus some amount of that and uh, in that basis. And then you can easily calculate what A does to the millionth power. So you can do huge powers of linear transformations, do them to enormous powers uh, by easy by hand calculations. So um, one of the basic facts that uh, we won't prove um, is that eigenvectors uh, from different, different eigenvalues are linearly independent. Um, and that's a useful fact because we don't have to worry about the danger that there might be some linear dependence. In particular, that immediately implies these are a basis because you have two of them and they're, they're linearly independent and you're in two dimensions. When you have two linear independent vectors in two dimensions, they have to be a basis as we pointed out before. So the fact here makes it so I don't even have to check that those are linearly independent. They come from different eigenvalues, so they must be linearly independent. And so that immediately makes it possible to, without having, even having, having to do any computation at all, to see those form a basis. So I can therefore split this, the linear transformation of this matrix, into a transformation of minus 1 in this direction, a transformation by 4 in this direction. And so it's very easy to see what the transformation is doing. So the, the, the result here that we have is it's fairly easy to check the interdependence of, of eigenvectors. The bad news is that sometimes there are bases and sometimes there aren't. This matrix had a basis of eigenvectors. Some matrices don't have bases of eigenvectors. So perhaps the simplest example that doesn't have a basis of eigenvectors is a, is, um, a very simple matrix looking like this. Um, If you try that one, you can check and see that it has uh, lambda as 0 as the only eigenvalue. Um, and you can check that it has only one eigenvector in uh, one direction of eigenvectors. So I'll leave you to check that one. It does not have a basis. A basis of eigenvectors. It doesn't have enough eigenvectors. So sometimes matrices fail to have as many eigenvectors as we'd like. We'd like it if every matrix somehow that we run it, ran into had a basis of eigenvectors, because now we know how to calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. First, we calculate eigenvalues as the determinant of the characteristic polynomial. Then we uh, plug each root in and check and find its associated eigenvectors. So we'd like it if we could just always calculate out everything using bases of eigenvectors, and then all linear transformations would be easy to calculate very quickly to very high powers. But that doesn't always work, because they're, they don't always have bases of eigenvectors. So the trick of using eigenvectors as the, basis of, as the right basis to work in doesn't always work. So unfortunately, it's, it fails for multiple reasons. That's one of them. Another um, problem we could run into is that uh, we could try something like this guy.
Um, this is uh, rather striking because it's a matrix with, as, as, as all of our matrices have been so far, they always have just ordinary real number entries. But in fact, if you calculate it out, you'll find that lambda is uh, i and lambda is minus i are the, are the eigenvalues. So it's an, a real matrix, but with complex eigenvalues because its characteristic polynomial has complex roots but doesn't have any real roots. So, um, so the easy answer here is use complex numbers instead of real numbers. We won't do that in detail, but you can see the, the philosophy here. If you have to, you move into the world of complex numbers, and you're forced to for even very simple matrices like this. This is a real matrix, real 2 by 2 matrix with very simple entries, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Already that matrix forces us to use complex numbers rather than real numbers. So we begin to see why we need complex numbers to do almost any uh, non-elementary mathematics. It should be lambda is, sorry, it should be plus 1 and plus i minus i are the eigenvalues. Um, so you have to use complex numbers instead of real numbers sometimes. You're forced into them by certain kinds of, of matrices. Um, so we, but we're not afraid of that because we know how to use complex numbers. The problem is even that doesn't work. Um, even that's not enough of a trick. Using complex numbers doesn't work on this one. Whether we work with real or complex numbers, this guy still doesn't have a basis of eigenvectors, even of complex eigenvectors of the complex, uh, complex vectors. Even if we allow complex numbers, it doesn't fix this problem. There's still a deep problem here that this thing still, even for complex number eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it doesn't have a basis of eigenvectors. So you can't fix things by adding complex numbers into the picture. In fact, you just can't fix things at all. There is no way to make this thing have a basis of eigenvectors. It won't work no matter what we do. So sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't um, that we can find a basis of eigenvectors. Um, so uh, there's a, a rather big theorem, uh, the spectral theorem, which we won't um, prove, as is the case for almost all the theorems in this course, uh, we won't prove it. Uh, it does say, uh, however, that it's a useful criterion for determining if there are eigenvalues and eigenvectors if A uh, is a symmetric matrix. So that's the same as saying A transposes A um, the, with uh, real entries then, um, in fact, A has only uh, real eigenvalues. All its eigenvalues are real, real numbers. And A has a basis of real eigenvectors. In our next lecture, we'll think about applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors to physical systems in population dynamics and in electro, um, in electrical systems.